Okay, let's go to John, John 14 today. This is like number 18, getting Jesus right. Number 18 from the Upper Room Discourse, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. <clears throat> I want to look at John 14, start looking at, start looking at John 14, 12 through 14. We do like a little mini-series within the series because there's an awful lot to unpack here. Uh, and as you can tell, the goal is to try to be not, <clears throat> you know, extremely thorough, but as thorough as we can. And we try to archive these. So if you're one of our Facebook folks, um, I should say, if you have trouble with the quality on Facebook, either it's the uh, audio or we don't have a great upload speed, uh, so could be a little pixelated, you can go to the website, which is just www. I'm talking to them now www. Foothills Christian Life Center, all one. Foothills Christian Life Center, lowercase, all one. www. Foothills Christian Life Center. com. Go to the Hope Chapel page, scroll down, and you'll see the whole series, all all of those, and they're they're on YouTube. They're all great uh, quality as far as audio and. Um, video and that type of thing. Also, because of the thoroughness or an approach to thoroughness of the studies, I go rather quickly, which means you're, you, there's a lot of stuff you wish you could write down but are unable to, so you have a pause button there. You can go back uh, from the beginning and you're going to be roughly investing about 40 minutes at a clip or do as much of it as you can, take down some notes, and you'd be impressed how much you, you can really learn. And it's for a good cause. It's getting Jesus right, so it's a good cause. All right, um, so now we have this thing about, as you see at the graphic up front, greater things uh, that we want to begin with, with today and a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of work, a lot of stuff to cover today, just sort of getting up and running. And you'll say, wow, if this is getting up and running, I need to see what the big thing is. Now, you won't hate it, <clears throat> but... You'll appreciate, maybe, a little bit, a little bit more about the subject. Uh, so, not to go a great deal into the context, but you're seeing, obviously, this is Jesus talking, and basically talking on the heels of what Philip had asked him regarding the Father, because Jesus said, listen, through me, you'll, you'll see the Father. You'll, you'll go to the Father. You'll know the Father, all those things, which to them, seeing is knowing, and all that, which we've explained before. Uh, Philip says, show us the Father. Of course, Jesus is equating himself with the Father. And we spent a number of weeks on a little series within a series talking about the deity of, of Jesus, the deity of Christ. And if you want to go back to the most recent four or five, I think you can learn a lot in that regard as well, how we justify that, how we defend that. Uh, it's not a position that we choose to because we prefer it. It's a position that we take because it's what the Bible says. It's like that. So we don't start with something and, make, and try to make the Bible say it. We see what the Bible says, and then we believe it. That's, I say we, hopefully, for all of us <laughs> and for you guys. Um, and so in that discussion, <clears throat> uh, Jesus is, is going to say these words. Um, let me just back up to 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father's in me, or at least, then he says, you want to justify beliefs. But I want to get the word works in here. Uh, or at least believe on the evidence of the works. So this is the NIV, how the NIV. Believe on the evidence of the works themselves. A bit of an expanded translation there, but I want to get the word works in there, which is erga, plural, erga, singular, erga, plural in the Greek. Um, and he's going to play off of that, the idea of works, works, believe the works. Obviously, the things that Jesus is doing, the miracles that Jesus is doing, right? These incontrovertible things that Jesus is doing. Now, hold that train of thought. Very truly, I tell you, all who have faith in me, do you know that very truly is amen, amen in the Greek? So, if a preacher's preaching and you say, amen, that's what's happening here. This is amen, it's the same. Uh, let it be so, something like that. When you put them against each other, uh, amen, amen, it's like 
Um, truly, I say this, but I mean really, really truly, I say, I say this. And that's what we have here, why we translate it very truly. I tell you, all who have faith in me will do the works. Erga, remember? Erga, ergon, singular. Erga, do the works, do the works, do the works. But now he's talking about not him, but others. Okay? Others. Others will do the works. What works? The works that you saw me do. I mean, that's just what it says. There's no debate on that. That's what it says. So he says, uh, will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater <laughs> the NIV. You got to love the NIV, right? Can I tell you, explain to you what an interpretive gloss is? An interpretive gloss is when you shove something in here that's not in the original, and it's not even italicized, you know? We're used to, those of us that have studied scripture, say, well, if it's italicized, that means we added it for the purpose of translation. Because some things, you know, when you render something from one language to another, you need to sort of put what is understood in there, what you think is understood, but because it's not in the original, you italicize it. Not italicized here, this is a pure interpretive gloss. In other words, this is a translator, not translating, but interpreting. There's a difference, right? There's a big difference. In the original, it says, they will do even greater. Even greater. And greater what? Right? So you have to determine by the antecedent of that. You have erga, erga twice. It's, it's quite simple. It's not, it's not difficult. Jesus says, my works, he'll do the works I've been doing, works, works, and then even greater, it's not greater things, if you want to understand it within the context. And I mean, the immediate context, and translate it properly, you would put works and greater works. We're categorically talking about the same thing. The reason this is indisputable is you go to the book of Acts and that's exactly what you see, right? So the question is not whether or not people are doing the things that Jesus did. That's not the question. That's not open for debate because you go to the book of Acts and what do you see? People doing the very things that Jesus did. The thing that's under debate, I suppose, or becomes controversial today is, is that still the case in the church? All right, so that's, that's for another, another discussion. We're just trying to understand and wrap our minds around what Jesus is saying here to his disciples. You know, that's our purpose. So he says, because I'm going to the Father. So there's a relationship between where Jesus is going, the one whom he's sending to us, and then how the sending of the Spirit, ultimately, will impact the mission of the church going forward. How is it going to function? How is it going to operate? That's ultimately what Jesus is trying to say. He said, guys, I'm not going to be here. I'm going. Very soon, I'm going. And when I go, things are going to change. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he's going to say, you're not going to ask me anymore. For example, uh, verse 13, and I will do whatsoever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. You can see, until this point, they're not doing that, right? They're not doing it. Why? He's standing right there. If you need something, ask him. You know, he's, he's right there, but he's not going to be there. So you're going to ask the Father in my name, and the Spirit's going to supply the you know, empowerment and things like that. All right, so we can't. This is a great big thing to bite off here, and we can't possibly. But if this is what I want to do the next few weeks or however long it takes is to, is to deal with this because it's so important and so integral to how we understand God, how we understand the role of Jesus to the body of Christ, how we understand the role of the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ. And in particular, let's just talk about prayer for a moment, a little bit here, maybe starting off this way. So I'm going to do this this morning, kind of Paul meets Jesus thing. You know, Paul meets Jesus again. He met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And so I say again, because um, this is sort of a little tongue-in-cheek because this is just to demonstrate how what Paul says or teaches agrees with what Jesus says. So these are two different things. You know, Jesus is talking here and teaching, and then Paul in his letters, and we're not going to do this exhaustively, but at least we'll demonstrate some agreement here. 
A uh, couple of guys, one Adrian Rogers, you may might know, uh, with the Lord now, uh, and Jim Cimbala. I right, said so two people. Jim, uh, pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle. We were listening to the choir here not long ago. Um, okay, for, for many, many years, right? And uh, Adrian Rogers. So, so Cimbala, I think his church is Assemblies of God, maybe. Assemblies of God. Um, Adrian Rogers with the Bellevue uh, Baptist in, in Memphis. This would be... Uh, Southern Baptist, right? So, two different, two different ends, ends of the spectrum, right? As far as uh, miracles, well, not miracles, but as far as maybe signs and wonders being done in the church, whether those gifts are still operative in the church. Two, but one thing that they're agreed upon because this quote comes off both of them. So, one thing they agree upon: prayer can do anything God can do. Prayer can do anything God can do. This is an awesome quote, by, by the way. So we understand prayer a little bit, and then we're going we're gonna to look at prayer within the context of what Jesus has said. Prayer can do anything God can do, and God can do anything. Uh, so I've heard Cymbala say, prayer can do anything God can do, and then I've heard Rogers say the same thing, and then add, and God can do anything, by the way, right? So it's really not a matter of ability, is it? Uh, if I can go fast enough... <laughs> If I can go fast enough, I'd like to end up in Ephesians 3.20 and just demonstrate this out a little bit more. This will give us a little continuity to the discussion about prayer can do anything God can do. I can show you why from that passage. Um, so we read John 14.12 through 14. Uh, look at Mark, for example, Mark chapter 9. Just another uh, take on what Jesus says. This is repeated in, in Matthew's gospel as well. But Mark chapter 9 and verses 14 through 29. So we can't read the, the whole thing. We can't take that much uh, time. But you could go back, now that you're watching this on video or something, you can go back and look at the entirety of this passage. Jesus is healing a boy that's possessed with an evil spirit. And this is the, the difficulty was that the disciples uh, really couldn't do anything about this, you know? Um, and so I'm trying to figure out where to jump in here. Um, well, verse, <clears throat> verse 17, a man in the crowd answered, Well, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashing at his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Remember, prayer can do anything God can do. God can do anything, right? This is sort of the um, the thesis that we're working on a little bit. You, unbe what does Jesus say? Well, of course you can, only I can do that. <laughs> he doesn't say that, right? You unbelieving generation. Of course, I have no audio here, so I have to imagine that he's not saying you unbelieving generation. Now, I think he's, he's really trying to get their attention here. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so they brought him. To Jesus. And when the Spirit saw Jesus, Spirit lowercase s here, uh, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus said to the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood. And has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, if you can do anything, think ability there, think the word ability there. If you can do anything, take pity on us. And then he says, If you can, if you can, and Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. So I'll take this from John uh, 14 and Mark. And again, this is not exhaustive. I've had to lay on a bunch of other stuff if this were to be the case. Ultimately, we have a dichotomy, dichotomy, which is two things operating at the same time, let's say. On the one hand, you have what God is able to do. On the other hand, you have what God is willing to do. And I'm going to tell you, they're not both the same. And we have to appreciate that when we come to prayer. So when we say something as boldly as God, uh, prayer can do anything, God can do it, God can do anything, that doesn't mean every word that comes out of your mouth translates into reality. You can't, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on today with this, right? Name it, claim it, or just, I, I speak the creative word and there it is, pops into existence. Well, no, 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 no. There are certain criteria then when you say prayer can do anything God can do. That's properly understanding then what prayer is and who God is, the one to whom we're praying. So just to prime the pump a little bit with that, you know, ability of God and the willingness of God. We pray according to God's 
ability a lot of times, you know, until, until he, he convinces us and provides us an answer or reveals to us what he's willing to do. I mean, there's some things in Scripture we know he's willing to do. We know he's willing to forgive. We know he's willing to save. We, right? we know all this stuff. We don't have to question that. God, are you willing to forgive me? God, are you willing to save me? All right, so we don't, not on that level. So um, how about Paul, uh, Philippians 4.19, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? So there's, there's the focus in the right. I can do. What if Paul just said, I can do all things? Now he's arrogant, right? But when he says through Christ, who the one who, if we're translating it this way, the one who gives me strength, the one who is giving me strength. So we want to test Paul's thesis out a little bit in light of Jesus' promise. Let me give you a rundown of some, like one through seven, very, very quickly. And again, this will force you to the video to write this stuff down, but I'm just going to throw this out. Can prayer really do anything God can do? Um, God always acts according to his nature. That's number one. Number two, the will of God, that is what he determines and not necessarily what he permits. Again, that understanding of the will of God between his determinate will and his permissive will, stuff like that. That's important to understand, but not today. Uh, the will of God, what he determines, not necessarily what he permits to do, is always accomplished. God's will is always accomplished, right? Right? Uh, three, what God determines to do is not a matter of uh, agreement with human preference or request. Four, human preferences or requests are informed or formed by prayer. Five, prayer directs the matter to God, surrenders personal preferences to the revelation of God's will. Right? Here it is, God. I'm, I will wait. I will wait for your will to be revealed in my circumstance. That's the answer that's going to come. Uh, so so it's, it surrenders personal preference to the revelation of God's will uh, after it directs the matter to God. It waits upon God and then experiences what God discloses in time. So a lot of times we'll say like, okay, I'm really, really praying about this but I don't want to run ahead of God. And what do we mean? I haven't got an answer yet. So I'm not going to presume on God's answer and just bolt, bolt forward, nor do we want to be on the other side where God does reveal something, but we're going to try to kick open a door he's shut. Right? It's that, that kind of understanding. So six, what God is able to do is not always what he's willing to do, uh, that is terms of his being bound or obligated and things like that. Now, there are certain exceptions to that in terms, we could argue in terms of salvation and certain uh, declarations and promises. So prayer, lastly, seven, prayer does not, cannot force the hand of God. It seeks God's disposal of the matter in terms of his will, his way, in his time. Now, now I'm just saying this in general. Right? So if you say, well, Doug, um, give me the, the short version of your parameters of prayer. Tell me how you understand prayer. Just hit the rewind and go back and run through those one through seven. That's the short version, basically. So let's bring this now into our present discussion a little bit about what Jesus says. Very truly, I tell you, all who have faith in me will do the erga, the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater erga, we're supplying, than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. That's pretty wide open, so we want to understand that. Uh, let's, review, let's review some things with relative to praying in his name, who he is anyway, um, as far as our, our recent studies. Um, so we, we have these I am sayings of Jesus in John's gospel, all right? So John's the one who, towards the end of the first century, is giving us the settled teaching of the church, and he's incorporating these things that Jesus did. He's either reporting to you uh, certain miracles, certain, certain sayings, teachings, all of that stuff, but this is John doing that. So he has, unlike any of the other gospels, 
included for us all of these I am sayings. 635, I'm the bread of life. 95, I'm the light of the world. 107, I'm the gate for the sheep. 1011, I'm the good shepherd. 1125, I'm the resurrection and the life. 146, I'm the way, the truth and the life. 151, I'm the true vine. And then going back to 858, where he says to the Jews, before Abraham was, I am, and that was a reference then back to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, where in Hebrew, um, uh, God is telling Moses when Moses goes into Egypt, and he says, hey, hey, uh, who am I going to say sent me? And, he, and then he uses this expression, either I am who I am or I will be who I will be, you know, however you translate that. And so, you could say, off the lips of Jesus, right, I am, and put a fill in the blank. Put a fill in the blank. This is what basically God was telling Moses. I am, basically filling in the blank, I am what you need me to be. I am what you need me to be that is in this sense. Uh, suppose you understand who God is, right? This is who God is. In his being, this will tie in with Ephesians 3.20. This is who God is in his being. So in other words, you get in a situation, whatever that situation is, from just having food in the cupboards to a roof over you, just any number of these things that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, God is saying, I am, and fill in the blank there, I am, uh, I'm always God. You know, like, I need you to be God in this situation, however you understand that. And Jesus is saying a very practical sense, isn't he? Hey, I'm bread because you need to eat, you know, but I'm going to sustain you, not so much in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. And so Jesus is, is commonly raising the level of our expectation among the purely mundane and temporal things of this world, those things we need to exist to a much higher level, a much higher level that of uh, life of satisfaction that can only be found in him. So prayer, prayer understands that all we are, all that we become, all that we need for every contingency of life, he is. Right? Sounds like Hebrews. Sounds like Hebrews 11.6. For without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God he that comes to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That he is what? That he is, and then there's a fill in the blank, right? And so every contingency, that is to say, every pressing need, every urgent matter, that's Ephesians 3.20 again, that'll come in, uh, in case we have to hit the fast forward to that. Um, that's what Jesus is saying. Uh, this is met in my being. We tend to focus on that which only God can supply us with. So we have our hand out, and we, we look to the hand of God instead of the face of God, if we can put it that way. And we miss a whole lot doing that. God said, I want you to be satisfied ultimately with who I am, not necessarily what I can give you. Imagine if we only think of God in terms of what he can give us, right? How that changes everything. Imagine whether that's a marriage, whether that's a, a, a really good close friendship, you know, stuff like that. Um, and you only care about that person because of what down the list they can do for you. But not, and, and you can appreciate all that. And it's wonderful. But rather, you know that it's a much more intimate relationship when you care for them, not because of what they can do, but because of, of who they are. Think of God the ultimate example of this. So um, a, a few, let's just grab Philippians for a second. So we switch over to Paul, and I warned you we were going fast. Uh, Philippians 3, or Philippians 4, I'm sorry. Philippians 4, we were there earlier. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, 4.13. How about, I'm sorry, um, yeah, 4.13, I can do all, all, all this, it says in the NIV, all this through him, who gives me strength, uh, then you look over at chapter 3, 1 through 14, where Paul seems to link this relationship that he has with God through Christ 
in terms of not what Paul can do, but who God is. And you have to, you really have to understand this because you don't want to interpret, I can do all things through Christ, which gives me strength, as I can earn my salvation, I can do blah, 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 right? All this stuff. Um, so in 3, 1 through 14, he really establishes how bankrupt he is in terms of um, his need before God. And he says, but whatsoever gains were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what were gains to him before? All of his righteous conduct, his obedience to the law, his perfect obedience to the law as so he thought or his peers the other pharisees he says all that stuff is like a ship trying to cross the mediterranean a cargo ship and a storm comes up in order to save the ship which is his life he had to ditch all the cargo this is the gain loss he uses nautical terms here the stuff that that i thought i needed to embark on this journey and to come to my destination, the stuff that I thought, and I said, yeah, load it on, load it on, load it on, and that ship had all my precious cargo. What was my precious cargo? All of my righteous deeds. And when that storm hit, all that stuff had to go overboard. Overboard, right? And what did he gain? I consider everything lost, everything lost, but the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for sake I've lost All things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and, this is the key, being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, all this stuff, right? Um, This is that I am part. This is that I am part. And this is that... I am this. And this is plugging into who he is rather than what he can give to us. In Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Luther focused on that and said it must be, while he was in Uh, a monk in the Augustinian order, trying to live by the rule of Augustine, which, believe me, is not, it's a few pages. It's not not a lot, but still, couldn't do it, couldn't do it, couldn't do it, did it so that he could somehow prove to God that he was righteous, you know? And, And he was understanding that, this righteousness that I do for God, and suddenly it just hit him. This is God conquering this man's will. It's it's not a righteousness you perform for God. It's a righteousness that God gives to you. So, And he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's 521 of 2 Corinthians. Um, Look at Galatians 2.20. And then I want to finish with uh, Ephesians 3.20. Galatians 2.20. I just want to pull this out just as an example. Um, So here's Paul. And many times in Paul's writings, though they're very sort of, I want to say, didactic or teaching oriented. You think you're sitting in a classroom with Paul's approach. He doesn't use narrative. He doesn't tell stories. This is like a, a lesson, like a lecture that you would get. But every once in a while, he bursts into these sort of very self-revealing statements that it's like, can I just, I, my case is that everything Paul writes is born out of his own walk with the Lord, his own discipleship. It seems like it's tedious and it's hard to understand. But this is Paul basically who experienced all this first and now is trying to put it into writing and trying to explain it and describe it. And here's one of them. You know, I've been crucified with Christ uh, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the, in the flesh, in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, let me put it to you this way. You know, wow, how, and now, right? Uh, so one time I looked up a uh, description of one of these elevator speeches, right? So, okay, Doug, you talk too much. So how can you get it down to just this real crisp, clean, what do you want to say? And so you imagine yourself, you're on an elevator, you know, and you've got, what, 30 seconds, a minute, 
with the person on that elevator to get, what does he got to say? You know, what does he got to say? Oh, it's a bit of an analogy, but that's what you have here. And one, one guy explained, well, just think of it in terms of wow, how, and now. If we can remember that. Where's the wow? I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. That's Paul saying, wow, look what happened to me. I've been wiped out. Now he says it differently in Philippians, right? He says, my ship is empty and it belongs now to Christ. So I have that. But this is his version of the wow that he never got over. He never got over this Damascus Road experience. He never got over the change that was wrought in him. I have been crucified. I've been conquered. I'm part of what he died for. I have this atonement. I no longer live. Listen, if you can get the wow, how, and now of this verse, it'll radically transform your life because this declaration, I no longer live. Doug lives a lot, too much, way too much. But if you get a hold of this, I no longer live, then, then what is the how part? What's the how then? If the wow is true, what's the how? But Christ lives in me. The life I, here's the now, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So here's his little description, I should say. It's, it's a powerful one. His confession of how he understands the Christian life. Now, let's go to 320 because we chose in John 14, or I chose, uh, John 14, 12 through 14, I chose to focus on the very end. And then we're going to go back and talk about the greater, greater things, the greater works as it relates to this. But Ephesians 3.20, this dealing with, with prayer, and that's what Paul is talking about. He doesn't mention prayer in here at all, but this is what he's talking about in Ephesians 3.20. You'll notice the context, uh, Christ dwelling in your hearts through faith, and he's being very doctrinal, you know, in a full teaching mode until he comes to this doxology. Uh, some churches will sing the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, and this, this thing, right? And it's awesome, awesome lyrics, right? Awesome lyrics to this thing, so true. But a doxology comes from doxa, you know, which is to glorify, to, you know, basically render to God the praise worthy to his name, to praise God, to glorify God. Paul cannot sustain without intermittent um, uh, doxologies, like he bursts into this. Like he's sitting here uh, trying to describe very carefully who Jesus is, who God is, and it just overwhelms him eventually. It just starts building up in his being, <laughs> and he explodes into this doxology. Maybe not explode, but now... To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that's at work in us. Easy to memorize. Awesome, awesome passage. Let me just point a few things, uh, point out a few things to you. One is this idea of uh, to, to him, now to him. Uh, it's not going to be really noticeable in the English, but it needs to be understood. Um, because you have some present tense things and all of these things are working, are operative at the same time. So while you're looking at that, I'm going to tell you that when you translate it, it's now to him, but actually to him who is able. It's like this. Now to the one yeah, who has the ability, but it's present tense. This is the fundamental understanding we have to have about prayer. When we direct everything heavenward, it is to whom? It is to the one who always has the ability. You have to understand that. Now, again, he may not be willing in that particular situation. He may have something else for you, but it'll always be good in the end. But listen, you got to grab a hold of this because I don't know how you understand that. Where it says, now to him who is able, right? But in the Greek, this is present tense saying, the one who always, who, who always has a bit, but... It's better than that. It's the one being able, always being able, in his being, because of who God is in his nature, in his character, there is nothing. There is nothing outside the bounds of his ability. And so you say, okay, give us some context on that. So drop down a little bit further in the verse, and let's just get to this part. Um, 
above all that we ask or think. All right, so here you are, number one up here, imagine up here, up here is, is, is who God is. Who is God? The one to whom I'm praying, the one who's always able in his being. Um, God, are you able today? That's never a question. Okay, so I'm gonna ask something, I'm gonna think something. Here's your asking, here's the word, here's the word. In the Greek, it refers not just to like, uh, Paul, could you pass me that cup? No, it's not that, it's not that asking. This is like begging, this is urgency. So the person who's directing this one to whom has all ability all the time because of his being is urgent about something. That also is present tense. Watch this. So this is present tense, meaning keeps on asking, 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 asking. That's urgent, 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 urgent. It's pressing matter, pressing urgent, 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 urgent. At the very same time, he's able, 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 able. So you got these things going on at the same time, at the same time. Also at the same time, ask or think. Think is not really where we're at here. Think is more imagine. The verb has to do with how you evaluate the circumstances, right? How you sort of have um, your understanding of it in this sense, how you think the case to be. And so here you are, urgent, imagining things as maybe not they are or maybe as they are, as they will be, and you've got all this going on, at the very same time, he remains, I'm able. Okay, so here you are. God, I'm urgent, I'm urgent, I'm urgent. He's answering, I'm able. This is the answer. This is the answer. I'm able, I'm able, I'm able, I'm able. He might say, trust me, trust me, but I'm able. It's implied. Trust me, I'm able. You know who I am. I hope you know who I am. Because of that, you know I'm able. Trust me, I'm able. But, 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 but. I imagine this, but, but, but you, you, let me explain to you, God, how things are, because I know you don't know. So let me explain to you, right? We do all this stuff. How does he answer? I'm able, I'm able, I'm able, I'm able, right? Now, the other present tense is at the end, according to the power that's at work in us, All right? So he uses the same word for ability. The one that's able is dunamis, dunamis. Okay, now that can have a whole range from miracle working power. Yeah, Luke uses it, Luke 24, 49. Wait for power on high, Acts 1, 8. You shall receive power. It's all dunamis, dunamis stuff. It's all consistent with what we'll see in John chapter 14. Okay, but it's this type of ability. Not every time, not every time. Sometimes it's just referring to ability, but this is God's ability here. This is God's ability. In prayer, it's God's ability that takes front and center on the stage, not my ability. So why should I be so concerned if I look at the circumstances and see what Doug can do in this situation? Who cares? Who cares? And I could never educate myself enough. I could never train myself enough. I can never learn all the nice skills that you guys have. I can never do all of that so I could be a fully autonomous, independent unit. Don't need God for anything. In fact, I need God for everything. Even on my, my best day with my skill set just up there where I think it is, which really isn't. So all along, God is saying, I'm able, I'm able. It's his ability that we want to bring into this thing. His ability, okay. Um, according to the power the power that's at work in us, that's present tense, that is working. I am able, constantly doing. I am asking at the same time. I, at the same time, I'm asking and imagining. Let's put those in the middle. At the same time, I'm asking and imagining. There are other two constants going on. His ability and his empowering. His ability, his power working in us working in us. He's already supplied us with the wherewithal to, per, to perform what his will demands of us. So if he calls us to a holy life, we must have the means by which to do that. We have the spirit of God to do that. If he calls us to do something in ministry, it's not because we're anything great, but because we're a vessel in whom God's spirit resides who, who can do that. So we need never shy away from anything. 
period. What God, listen, God's going to do two things, he's, or at least one thing very well. He's going to put you in a situation that absolutely doesn't fit your skill set. He's going to put you in a situation that demands his gifting, not your natural talents. And mm, Christians get this wrong. They say, oh, spiritual gifts are my natural talents or something like that. You know, you can have natural talents. That's phenomenal. God gave you those as well. Great. Perfect them. Do the best you can with them. But I'm going to tell you, you don't run away from some situation God's put you in or some work he's put in front of you or something that seems like a mountain and you can't, you have, there's no way because he supplies that gift. This is an awesome thing about the body of Christ is the gifting. It blows my mind to see us sort of relatively stupid, ignorant people who don't know how to do anything function with some lever, level of facility in something that God has put before us simply because he's put it in us. But anyway, this is a bigger discussion, but it's a good one. So I just wanted to see, just to see the relation of those tenses. Now, uh, just let me bring it in for a landing here. So if we read this, now unto him, the one who is continually able to do. And then I ask the question, um, how? How or in what way is he able to do that? What does it look like? Tell me, please, what it looks like because that's going to satiate my panic mode and it's going to clarify my imagination, right? And he says, he doesn't say, just imagine. I like to say, what if Doug was writing this? You know, Doug would just like leave out uh, some things and just say, I would just tell you flat out God's able to do that. You know, that'd be boring. You say, Doug, what about this? Oh, God's able to do that. That'd be boring. So Paul, the spirit through Paul says, how God is able to do it. Um, over, beyond, right? So he says, he's able to do beyond what you ask and think. So I say, hey, that's a nice, uh, that's bumping it up. He's able to do beyond what I'm desperate for, beyond what I imagine to be impossible, all this stuff. But he doesn't stop there, does he? He adds that additional word, extremely beyond everything you could. And for me, there is nothing. I have, I have nothing. I have nothing. What can I do but just kneel before him in utter dependence, which is right where he wants us, right? Um, so this is an invitation by Paul always to lift our expectations beyond the temporal, earthly, mundane, uh, beyond ourselves to the one who I, I would add, I would add, not that you should, I would add who alone. I, this is just me, you know, like here's the expanded Doug translation, you know, now to the one who alone is able, right, to do, which just the description, if you can do everything, you're God. And since you cannot do everything, you're not God, which is, by the way, the best confession when your feet hit the floor and you wander into the bathroom. And if you dare to stand before the mirror at that time, you just confess two things. There is a God and I'm not him. And you don't get you through the day um, if you don't have anything else. So let's park it there and... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll be coming back. We'll be coming back to John 14 in the weeks ahead. Lord, thank you for your, your word. Thank you for speaking uh, to us through your word. Thank you for your spirit who teaches and guides. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, uh, as was prayed earlier today, um, that the, just that very appropriate sense that you're father and we're, we can be called uh, the children of God today. Why? because we have this wonderful father who sent his son to pay the price we could not pay to give us the life that we did not have. And we're so, so, so thankful for that. Uh, and uh, Lord, just guide us throughout the day with thoughts upon who you are, who you always are, blessings on, on the dads and the families as well. Uh, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.